Okay, um, so today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Lon Lowe, who joined our movement disorders team uh, fairly recently, like half a year ago, um, but has quickly become a very integral part of our center through seeing patients in the clinic, engaging in a multitude of research projects, helping out with our educational programs, and playing a very important role in our DBS program. So if you haven't had the chance to meet or interact with Dr. Lowe yet, I'm very glad that you get the opportunity today um, and strongly encourage you to ask questions at the end of her talk because she has a lot of um, expertise on the subject that we're covering today and also many other topics in PD. As far as asking questions, just a reminder that we are recording the event today. So at the end when it's time to ask questions, I'm going to be walking around with the mic um, and just ask that um, you wait until I get to you with the microphone so that we can hear your question um, on the recording. And, okay? Um, so today, Dr. Lowe is going to be discussing all of the complexities of freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease, including um, some of the reasons it might be happening, who is more susceptible, and some of the treatments. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to pass it along to Dr. Lon Lowe. Can everybody hear me? Thank you so much for that introduction, Stephanie. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming out today to uh, hear my talk. It's a lovely day today, so hopefully you get to enjoy the nice weather after my talk is done. So today, um, just a little bit about my uh, background. Uh, I did my medical education, medical school training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. I subsequently stayed there for a uh, neurology residency. And then after that, I uh, did a fellowship in movement disorders at Columbia University in New York um, under the guidance of Dr. Stanley Fong. Uh, many of you may know his name. He's a big uh, major uh, figure in Parkinson's disease and has contributed significantly to the field. And then after my fellowship, um, I also uh, did a, a master's uh, degree training in neuroepidemiology at Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. And then after that, I uh, joined uh, faculty here at Beth Israel in the Movement Disorders Division. So I'm very happy to be here. So today my talk will be about current approaches and hurdles in Parkinson's disease, uh, freezing of gait. I have no uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, I will be mentioning a few uh, devices that's out there in terms of uh, uh, helping with freezing of gates, but I have no, um, I have no uh, interest or I have no connections to uh, these uh, companies or these devices. So uh, some of the topics that will be covered today, uh, one is what is freezing of gates? Some of you may um, not be familiar with this concept, so I'll discuss what exactly it is. And then also I will be mentioning what are some of the triggers for freezing. Um, and then uh, after that, I will talk about how to describe the different types of freezing. There's, certain, there's five different subtypes of freezing, and I will be covering each of these. Uh, additionally, I will be mentioning about on versus off freezing of gait. These are different, uh, another way to describe freezing of gait in terms of your, uh, the time point of your medications and your, the clinical state of um, uh, your, or your condition as far as motor symptoms of, free, of uh, Parkinson's disease. Additionally, I'll touch on the brain pathways that are currently known that are implicated in freezing. And then also in the Parkinson's disease population, who exactly uh, will get freezing and what are some of the predictors uh, for freezing gait. And then finally, what are the available treatments as far as medications, um, physiotherapy, which involves uh, certain auditory and visual cues, as well as electroconvulsive therapy and deep brain stimulation therapy. And then uh, finally, I'll talk about how to avoid falls when uh, during that freezing gait, 
because freezing gait can lead to many falls and many injuries. So this is a video from uh, the journal The Lancet depicting the freezing of gait. As you look at this video, this gentleman has freezing here in the midst of his walking. And then you see him freeze right there as he's about to make his turn to the left. And there, that's also the, the same episode. Turns is often a, a trigger of freezing gait, uh, turning either left or right. And then now he's able to walk again. And then also doorways, going through doorways could be another trigger. And I'll explain a little bit about this later. See there, he's, uh, he has the freezing episode. And then again, this is a uh, 360 degree turn. As he's turning to the right, you see him, uh, he has the freezing gait there. There's some <coughs> trembling of his left leg as he's uh, going about this turn. There's some more freezing there and troubling <coughs> of that leg. Okay, so I will pause the video and then we'll get back to the video in a little bit. Okay, this is uh, a, a gentleman that I saw at Columbia when I was uh, doing a study about freezing of gait with uh, pressure sensors um, in a special shoe that he's wearing. And you see that when he goes to turn, he has a freezing of episode there. Now he's uh, unfrozen, and he's able to walk straight down the hallway. It was quite interesting that this gentleman, oh, there's another freezing episode there, and see trembling of his legs. This gentleman actually came to me first with, uh, during the medication on state, in which he took his medication, and I saw him about one hour afterwards. He took his levodopa carbidopa levodopa, or cinnamon. Uh, there's another episode of freezing. Um, but during that time after he took his medications, I did not see a single episode of freezing. However, when I asked him to come back again to uh, about 12 hours after his last dose of cinnamon, that was the, the trigger for him. That was what elicited the freezing episodes. So you see here, this is actually in the morning before any uh, of his uh, cinnamon medications. Uh, about 12 hours after his last dose. Um, he only took them the night before. So this is very important as, uh, as we go through this, the slides about freezing. And this is actually one of the clues that may help us to uncover some of the mysteries about what freezing, how freezing comes up about. <coughs> Okay, so freezing, as you've seen in these uh, couple of videos, it's uh, a feeling as if the feet is glued to the ground. People often describe it this way. It's an episodic motor phenomenon characterized by temporary cessation of walking, which can last a few seconds, usually lasting less than 10 seconds. Um, there, it can be as, as um, more as uh, third, up to 30 seconds, however, most commonly is less than 10 seconds. Uh, more than half of Parkinson's disease patients with more than five years of disease will experience freezing gait. So it's a huge problem and one of the uh, most debilitating motor features of uh, Parkinson's disease as well as other atypical forms of Parkinsonism. It can lead to falls loss of independence, needing to use assistive devices such as a cane or a walker or uh, eventually a wheelchair. It can lead to embarrassment and definitely reduce quality of life. So there's uh, actually with atypical Parkinsonism, which are mimickers of Parkinson's disease, uh, these other types of disorders uh, 
we see them most more commonly with freezing compared to Parkinson's disease. So some of these, uh, for example, is vascular Parkinsonism. And what that is, is you have features of Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, such as the bradykinesia, which is a medical term for slowness. You have some stiffness of the body and uh, difficulty with walking, especially in uh, the legs, the lower limbs. Uh, it's difficult to move the legs. Uh, this is usually accompanied by a lot of cerebral vascular disease, which can be seen on the uh, CT scan of the head or MRI of the brain. And uh, uh, there will be some uh, either ischemic lesions or it could be hemorrhagic lesions, um, cerebral vascular disease in the brain. Uh, the other is progressive supranuclear palsy. This is actually uh, some of the red flags that will point towards uh, PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy is that sometimes um, people will have difficulty moving their eyes downwards. They have trouble with um, following, for example, lines on the page or reading. Um, and uh, this is also accompanied by early freezing of gait. So compared with Parkinson's disease, which happens with more moderate to advanced stages of disease, freezing will occur earlier with PSP. Also, multiple system atrophy is another mimicker of Parkinson's disease. It's uh, in the umbrella of atypical Parkinsonism. So uh, what MSA is, is uh, it's usually accompanied by a lot of autonomic dysfunction early on. What that means is uh, sexual dysfunction, like erectile dysfunction, or a lot of urinary problems, urinary frequency, urgency, or incontinence. Um, and also a lot of uh, difficulty with uh, thermal regulation or um, controlling the body temperature, uh, along with orthostatic hypotension, which means a drop in blood pressure when uh, someone goes from a sitting to standing position. So lightheadedness, uh, dizziness, or fainting episodes. Um, other forms of atypical Parkinsonism include cortical basal syndrome or cortical basal degeneration, known as CBS for short, or CBD. What this is is um, something like alien limb phenomenon in which the one arm will move in its own. Uh, it's not able to be controlled by the person. Uh, additionally, uh, also dementia can occur in this disease early on. And then finally, dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, this is a, a case of uh, atypical Parkinsonism in which there is delirium or fluctuating consciousness or, and visual hallucinations may occur along with um, cognitive impairments um, uh, within the first year of motor symptoms of Parkinsonism. So uh, these, uh, the uh, bottom line here is that with atypical Parkinsonism, you may see freezing of gait early on, and it's usually a little bit more frequent in terms of um, the incidence of freezing of gait compared to Parkinson's disease. So there's uh, been three retrospective studies that has, have been done, uh, mostly by Dr. Jaladi's group um, from uh, Tel Aviv and also from uh, Dr. Lamberti group, who's looked at the, um, the uh, retrospective studies of uh, uh, freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. So he found that people with less than two years of Parkinson's disease, about 7% will have freezing of gait. Otherwise, um, for the people with five years of disease, about 28% will experience freezing. Uh, as you go further on into the disease, with 10 years, it's about 39%. And then finally, more than 10 years, uh, there's about 58% will get uh, freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. So what are the triggers for freezing of gait? So uh, the triggers on the, the first row, the top left-hand corner, <coughs> over here, this is a... Um, elevator. So for example, if you're in a time pressure situation, when you're trying to get into the elevator and you feel like the elevator is about to close, then uh, this is one of the triggers for freezing gait. Any t types of time pressure situations, for example, crossing the street, and you have to cross the street within a certain <coughs> amount of time, within a few minutes, uh, you know, before that, that uh, pedestrian sign is, goes away. So 
this can be one of the triggers. Additionally, as you're the second image here in the this row here, this is a doorway. As you're approaching the doorway, you can also get freezing. Um, this is uh, sometimes um, there's been hypothesis about why this is the case is that you sometimes have a sensory overload, so the visual processing may be affected, and that's why uh, it's too overwhelming for the brain to handle, and then your the brain cannot move the legs forward to uh, go through the doorway. Additionally, the, this last image on the top row is a very narrow space, very uh, tight corners or narrow space that can also be a trigger for freezing. So as you're trying to maneuver your body through the narrow space, that's very hard to, to do. And then of course the, tr uh, the freezing may happen. And then the bottom row here, the second row here, this gentleman is um, talking on his cell phone while walking. So this is an example of a dual motor task. So while he's holding up the phone with his hands, that's one motor task, and then you're walking is a second motor task. So if you have two, a dual motor or a dual processing of the brain, this can cause freezing because it's, again, it's an overload, it's overburdening the brain. And um, as you get a more progress in Parkinson's disease, then this is becoming harder and harder to do. And then uh, this last image is uh, turning. So turning can often be another trigger, whether turning left or right. Sometimes, you, as you saw in those videos, the gentleman was, had trouble turning to the left or to the right. And then uh, th there was leg trembling associated with the freezing. So these are different triggers for freezing. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I, yes, I can make it available, yeah. yeah. Yes, we'll provide a link after. So what are some of the contributors to freezing? As we've uh, mentioned before, one is uh, the motor aspect. So as you're turning your body uh, in either direction, this can be a trigger. Uh, additionally, there's a cognitive aspect. So uh, it's been uh, found that the anxiety uh, can play a huge part with freezing. So as you're approaching those time pressure situations like going through the elevator or trying to cross the street, you may become very anxious, and then that definitely will be will impact your walking. And then there's an affective part, in which uh, this image is here just to show like a threatening picture. If you're in this like threatening situation, for example, it's actually could be almost a protective mechanism. Sometimes uh, you just freeze in place. That's a natural mechanism when you're faced with a creature such as this. And then additionally, there's those environmental factors, like I mentioned, with uh, tight spaces or tight quarters that can be contributing to your walking, to your freezing. So all of these combined, it's a very complex phenomenon, and this uh, is, uh, is why freezing is very complicated. <coughs> oh, there's a doorway. Okay, so Dr. Fong, uh, in 1995, um, made five subgroup classifications for freezing of gait, and uh, they're listed here. There's a picture or cartoon depicting the types of freezing. One, as we saw in those videos, is turning. Turning can be a trigger, so uh, this is in relationship to the walkway. So if you're turning when you're walking, then uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the subtypes. And additionally, there is uh, going on this runway. So if you're walking and in the middle of your walking, uh, you experience freezing. That's what's called open space or runway hesitation. This is, um, and then uh, the third one is narrow gap or narrow space or hesitation in tight quarters. That's the third uh, subtype. And then the fourth type is a target hesitation. So as you're coming back, for example, going back towards your chair, towards a destination or uh, towards your, the target, then you have freezing there. That's called target hesitation or target freezing. And then the last one is called the start hesitation, meaning as you're just uh, going from a seated to a standing position and you're starting to walk, 
and you experience freezing, that's called start hesitation or start freezing. So five different subgroups um, have been described by him. So this is um, a study done by Dr. Shine from the University of Sydney in Australia in 2012. Uh, this was published in Parkinsonism and uh, Parkinson's and Related Disorders PRD journal, in which he looked at the different subtypes of uh, freezing. He um, uh, he recruited 24 patients that were seen at the Parkinson's Disease Center there, and uh, had them. Uh, be uh, examined in the off state, which means about 12 hours or um, not taking any medications that morning. Uh, the last dose would have been the night before. And then he uh, had them walk through um, different, and do different maneuvers. So for example, um, getting up from the chair and then walking down the corridor, turning around, going into the gate lab, and then uh, be examined by uh, you know, uh, going up from a chair and then walking down the hallway, turning around 360 degrees. And then he recorded what are the different subtypes of freezing that were seen. And in his study, he found that the majority, this column here, of uh, patients experienced turning when they had, uh, during the freezing, uh, or freezing with turning. Uh, that's about almost 60, almost 60 percent of the freezing episodes were during turning. Uh, you see that during this runway in the, or open space hesitation, it's a little bit less than that, around uh, 24, 25%. With the narrow gap or tight space hesitation or freezing, that's even less than that, uh, about maybe um, eight, eight or 9%. And then finally, even less are the target hes uh, hesitation or the start hesitation. So um, in his study, which is actually consistent with other studies that have been done, during this off state, or when your body does not have that much dopamine, or when your brain doesn't have that much dopamine, uh, then most commonly seen type of freezing is uh, while turning. Okay, so we, uh, I touched on this concept uh, earlier, but off freezing of gait, this is another way to describe freezing of gait, off versus <coughs> on. So off is off clinical state, it means that you're, you have low dopamine levels in the brain, and the freezing um, will happen when there are other motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So for example, uh, the other symptoms being the rest tremor, or uh, slowness of the movements, with like finger tapping, or with the leg stomping, um, those are slow movements or small movements. Uh, additionally, you can have stiffness of your body or um, a trouble with your balance. So those are other motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If you see freezing during that time, then that's called off-state freezing. Additionally, uh, this type of freezing, off-freezing <coughs> gait, will respond to levodopa. This is, as I alluded in the previous slide, this is often <coughs> seen while turning. Uh, compared to other types of freezing with uh, tight quarters, start hesitation versus uh, reaching target. The other type is on, uh, on clinical state freezing. And what this is, is that when your Parkinson's symptoms are <coughs> relatively well controlled, meaning the tremor is controlled, the stiffness and the uh, bradykinesia or the slowness of movements, if those symptoms are well controlled and you still have freezing, this is called uh, on state <coughs> freezing. And this usually does not respond to levodopa and sometimes may worsen or may be induced by levodopa. So this is very tricky because not the, taking your medication, whether it's uh, any type of dopaminergic medication, then uh, it can help with freezing, the off type of freezing, but then it may worsen or it may even trigger the on, t on state freezing. So it's very, very tricky um, in terms of medication management. This is a study by, uh, again, Dr. Gelati's group uh, from Tel Aviv in 2003. This is pub was published in the European Journal of Neurology. He looked at a uh, total of 19 uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. The average age was around 63. Their um, on-state Hon and Yar score, this is, um, basically staging of Parkinson's disease 
from one to five. Uh, five being uh, the worst um, stage or wheelchair bound, um, while one is the minimal stage or the uh, lowest, the least stage, um, being uh, symptoms being affected on one side of the body, asymmetrical involvement of one side of the body of Parkinson's disease. So here, the, during the on and off state, most of the people that he examined had a stage of three which means that both sides are affected, both sides of the body, plus you have a postural instability or your balance is affected. So the patients that he examined had that stage three. They had about 12 years of disease. Their total UPDRS, which is a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. This is a rating scale for Parkinson's disease in terms of the symptoms, was a score of 27, which is a fairly, I would say, mild in terms of their symptoms. Uh, their motor scores during the off state, the, in terms of their uh, motor symptoms, were 23 on average, and during the on state, it was about 10. So there's definitely improvement with levodopa, with the patients that he examined, which is another sign of Parkinson's disease, is uh, responsiveness to levodopa. And then they took about 730 milligrams of daily of levodopa. And uh, in the patients that he examined, he saw that during their off state, most of them, again, had turning hesitation or freezing gait during their turning. That's about 90, uh, actually almost all of the patients, uh, 18 out of 19 patients examined uh, had off um, freezing gait during turns. And then the, there's about a few, uh, um, few other people who had the other types of freezing. And then during the on state, you see that these numbers are relatively low which means that the medication helped their freezing for most patients. Nobody had any <clears throat> open run hesitation or open space uh, freezing of gait. Uh, there's a fewer numbers with uh, turning, freezing gait during turns, and then a few others scattered uh, during for start hesitation, tight quarter hesitation and upon reaching destination. This is again a schematic diagram showing that the turning uh, during the off state, when the, there's low dopamine levels in the brain, this is the most prevalent type. And you see other forms are less. The uh, black bars here means the, this is the off state versus the, uh, the uh, checkered um, bars are on the off, on state. And the numbers are definitely less compared to the black bars, meaning that the, the freezing responded to medication and then these, uh, for the off state, the highest was uh, freezing during turns. Uh, this is, uh, he also looked at the duration of uh, freezing episodes, and he saw that he divided into uh, four different groups. The first group being uh, freezing for one to two seconds, second group uh, freeze for about three to 10 seconds, and then 11 to 30 seconds, and 30 seconds and over. Do you see that almost nobody had any freezing that lasted over 30 seconds? So these are very short, brief episodes. There, it's an episodic disorder or episodic phenomenon. And uh, most of them during the off state, which are, the, again, the black bars, they have freezing you know, from anywhere from one to 10 seconds. And then during the on state, uh, it's also in this range from one to 10 seconds. But uh, with taking levodopa, he found that the frequency uh, or the duration and the duration of the freezing actually uh, became shorter with, the, with medication. This is a, uh, he also looked at the leg movements during freezing. So he divided this into three groups. One is taking small steps right before the freezing. Another is trembling in place, as we saw in those previous two videos. One of the legs, uh, there were some trembling, shaking of the legs during that freeze. And then the third group is akinesia. This means no leg movements. The leg is very still during those freezing episodes. So we see here that the most significant thing that he found was that for the on state, which are these checkered bars here, you almost have nobody with any akinesia state. Uh, this is likely um, means that with the medication, with the, any dopaminergic medication, you get some movements. You're able to overcome the akinesia part of the freezing. 
and, and you see that during the off states, you have a bit of, uh, of everything. Uh, the small, small steps, trembling in place, and some with akine akinesia. But the most commonly um, found was uh, taking small steps. This is another study by Dr. Lieberman um, at the Barrel Neurological <coughs> Institute uh, in uh, Arizona, where he looked at um, patients that he had seen in his clinic for about 18 months. There were a total of about 850 patients with either Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease or atypical Parkinsonism. And he studied, um, he studied 39 patients who have freezing of gait, uh, either that they were either unresponsive to levodopa, or not responsive to the cinemat medications, or uh, responsive to levodopa. So within these groups, there's a combination of people with Parkinson's disease, as well as atypical Parkinsonism. So it's a scattered um, types of patients in his study. He, the average age was about 66.9 for those patients not responding to levodopa, and 67.4 who responded to levodopa. This was not significant between the two groups. Um, one thing uh, that to, to, um, uh, to pay attention to on this slide is that for the Honan Yard, Yard stage greater than four, he found that this is a little bit higher in this group uh, who were unresponsive to levodopa compared to those who are responsive to levodopa, meaning that they were a little bit further along in the Parkinson's disease uh, in the in those freezing gait, unresponsive to levodopa compared to the other group. And uh, he saw that there more people had 15 out of 18 in this group had two or more falls. So those that didn't respond to the medication uh, will be more likely to fall or have more falls per month than the other group. And then uh, he also looked at what are the, the freezing scores and the postural instability or balance scores between the two groups. He found that for the freezing subscore, this is a score on the uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, UPDRS, and uh, it's a, score, a severity of freezing with one being very mild or intermittent or sporadic freezing, with four being freezing almost during, uh, during, even during straight walking, a very severe type of freezing. Um, he found that there were a little bit more patients in this group, those that were unresponsive to levodopa, eight, 11 out of 18 versus four out of 21 who were responsive to levodopa. And he, uh, the poll test, poll subtest, this is a, uh, the poll test in which uh, is done during the clinic. The, uh, for example, the clinician may pull you by your shoulders back, and then uh, however many steps you take after the poll will be an indicator of your balance. So if uh, the poll test score is greater than three, that indicates that you took um, several steps and you had to be uh, caught by the examiner then that's a very severe form of postural instability and balance trouble. And this group that didn't respond to levodopa had a little bit higher, um, about 15 out of the 18 participants had, did not do so well on the pull test versus 11 out of 21 on the other group um, didn't do well. And then also on the gate subscore, which is these bottom two columns, uh, there is a little bit decrease of step length compared to the other, other group, but this was not uh, statistically significant here. So now we get to the pathophysiology of freezing of gait. What is known about the different parts of the brain that's involved in freezing? So this is a quite complicated slide, but it just shows you that there's multiple different neural pathways that's involved. Uh, the one thing that I want to point out is that this the striatum is affected. This is a deep part of the brain. Uh, also called the basal ganglia. And uh, with Parkinson's disease, the dopamine, there's dopamine depletion here, which in turn uh, affects this part of the brain, the globus pallidus internal. And this part gets overactivated and it's, it has an inhibitory response to some of the other parts of the brain. So this red arrow here, it goes to the thalamus and also to the brainstem. So it will in turn inhibit those two portions of the brain to cause uh, difficulty with freezing and with other motor tasks. 
So uh, that's one, one of the pathways that's involved. But there, as you can see, there's multiple different pathways, <coughs> the direct and the indirect pathways, and uh, it affects different parts of the brain. So <coughs> cognition, could, uh, that's uh, over here. This, uh, the cognitive portion, the frontal lobes, could also be impacted. So trouble with um, executive uh, dysfunction, trouble with attention or set shifting, meaning that if you had um, to, uh, for example, trails is a one test on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment for memory. It's one way to assess that. So if you had to connect dots going from a number to a letter and then do that in the alternating pattern, so connecting from number one to the letter A, from A to the number two, and so forth and so forth. That type of um, mental uh, ability is affected in uh, freezing gait as well as Parkinson's disease. So there may be some correlation with some cognitive aspects that uh, also um, plays a role in freezing. So there's been uh, studies that's been done through Datatop, which is um, a database of uh, collected of Parkinson's disease patients uh, showing that there's some predictors of freezing of gait, which is uh, gait problems. So meaning people that take small steps or have a shuffling gait, this is one of the predictors of freezing. Otherwise, balance impairment. So if uh, the, on the pull test, you take m multiple steps or you have trouble with your balance, or have multiple falls, this could, can also lead to freezing. Otherwise, uh, speech issues. So sometimes people have stuttering, otherwise uh, pe people with um, difficulty with uh, word production. There's, sometimes there's a phenomenon called freezing of speech in which people have that trouble. It's almost a similar motor phenomenon as the legs, but exhibited in the speech format. Uh, people just have that uh, temporary hesitation with their words. Um, it's another uh, predictor. Additionally, uh, bradykinesia is a pr another predictor versus the tremor type of Parkinson's disease. Tremor type is a little bit less likely compared to the bradykinesia dominant form of Parkinson's disease. Uh, another study found that not using a dopamine agonist like a ropinerol uh, could be a contributing to freezing, lower education levels or mood symptoms like anxiety and depression. Um, cognitive decline, like uh, memory loss, along with sleep disorders, such as REM behavior sleep disorders, that could also be contributing. So these are, uh, there were three studies that looked at predictors of freezing, and this is a compilation of those three studies and what they found. So this, um, this is about the different treatments that are currently <coughs> available for freezing. I'll go through a few of these. Uh, basically, the top uh, three items are dopaminergic medications. One is the levodopa, other one known as carbidopa levodopa, Cinemet. Those are the yellow tablets um, that some of you may t be on. And levodopa does improve freezing of gait, but it's only the off type of freezing. Those that's associated with the low levels of dopaminergic um, neurons in the brain, or dopamine levels in the brain. So this is, uh, some of these on the other, this column is the level of evidence. So level A1 is the best level of evidence that we have, meaning there's meta-analysis and extensive studies done. Uh, level uh, A2 is not so great, but there's been maybe perhaps a few randomized controlled clinical trials done on the medication. And then level C, uh, there's, um, there's some you know, case reports or other articles about this medication, and then level D is an expert opinion about the medication. So for dopamine agonist, actually this article found that there's more new freezing of gait episodes compared to levodopa, um, but it could be effective in certain cases. So it's still, um, it's still a little bit controversial as far as the dopamine agonist. Uh, in certain cases, for example, the on-state freezing in which uh, the, these medications can worsen freezing, dopamine agonists will not be helpful in those cases. So monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, such as risagiline or selegiline, this has shown to perhaps reduce risk of developing freezing gait. This is a level of A2, which is a relatively good 
a good amount of evidence that we have about um, MAOB inhibitors. STN and GPI stimulation, these are the two targets for deep brain stimulation. And uh, GPI is globus pallidus interna. It's one of the sites that I showed you on one of the earlier slides about the neural networks of freezing gait. And then uh, STN stands for subthalamic nucleus. These are different parts of the brain which has been shown to improve the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And uh, some of you may be familiar with the deep brain stimulation surgery as an alternative option to treat Parkinson's disease. So this, uh, there's some, this again is very controversial now. There's been more studies uh, since this, this paper has come out, uh, which shows that certain, for certain uh, STN locations and GPI, um, it can actually worsen freezing, uh, and in certain cases, it may be a bit beneficial. So for SDN, there's more articles about that, which show that it can help with the off-state freezing. So again, those that have um, the low dopaminergic levels in the brain, it can help with that subset of freezing. But with other subsets, if you have the on-freezing, it would not be likely to help or could induce that free those freezing episodes. Methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin, it can perhaps improve some certain types of freezing. This is a level B evidence. And then uh, intraduanal levodopa gel, a duopa gel, may, be, uh, it may show some improvement, a level C evidence here. And then uh, these are also either level C or D evidence in terms of amantadine, uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial direct current stimulation or PPN stimulation. This is a, another site for deep brain stimulation. It's along the brainstem called the pedunculopontine nucleus. Again, this is very controversial. There's been more reports now about PPN DBS. <coughs> and again, it's, it's uh, very controversial right now as far as um, that target is concerned. So for dopamine resistant freezing of gait, uh, there's some studies about these uh, types of therapies, droxydopa uh, plus entecapone. These are two other types of medications. There's insufficient data currently. And then duopa uh, levodopa gel, um, that's also shown to have level D or expert opinion evidence about improving freezing gait. And then the STN stimulation mantadine may not even show any improvement in this type of freezing. So <laughs> with this, Dopamine resistant or on type of freezing, it's very, very hard to treat and uh, it may not be helped with any of these medications. So uh, there are some physiotherapy that involves visual and auditory cues. Uh, I just show some examples here. One is called a laser cane in which you press a button on the cane and it, uh, you, it actually uh, shoots a laser line along the floor and then a person can step over the line as a way to unfreeze themselves. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, as you see, uh, this is a U-step walker that's fitted with a uh, ryth rhythmic cue or like almost like a metronome. So you can press that button and then you hear a sound like a, the metronome and a person can actually step in tune with the metronome with that sound to almost like a marching type of uh, walk and that can also uh, unfreeze, um, you, they can unfreeze themselves that way. This is uh, the laser shoe, which has just come out. Uh, this was published in the journal Neurology uh, just last year. Um, and this is a shoe, a regular shoe that's outfitted with this device that is controlled by a pressure mechanism. So, uh, but with your, as you're moving, as you're stepping along, um, it actually senses the pressure uh, on this foot there's a switch here, and then once you are walking, uh, and then that line will be generated with each step. So there's a way to step over that line with the contralateral foot, this foot. So this is an example, let me go back to that original video to show what that looks like with the visual cueing and the auditory cueing. So I'll just, uh, I think we left off here. So he's just freezing with, while turning. The 
this is visual cueing. So as you see, there's lines that's masking tape on the floor. He's able to walk very well with these lines because it's almost like it's a different part of the brain is activated when he's trying to step over the lines and that's actually a way to unfreeze. And this is a rhythmic, um, I'm not sure if the volume is actually, uh, you're able to hear anything here, but there's actually a, a metronome sound. Uh, try to increase the I'm not sure, if, I don't think the volume is, can be heard, but it's, it, imagine it's, it's a metronome basically sounding device and you hear that beat and he's able to walk in tune with the beat. Um, is that the object she told me? Yes, yes. And then he's doing well here, so you see he's not, and this is the on phase, so he's after, an hour after he's taken his dopaminergic medication, he's able to walk very well here. So this is, I, I would um, predict this, he has a mainly off state freezing that's able to be corrected by the, um, by the medication. And he's turning very well here as well. Yeah. Uh, this is the same video with auditory cueing, which the sound is in. Okay, so for electroconvulsive therapy, there is one small study from Barcelona that was done in 2012 that evaluated the effectiveness of ECT for freezing. They recruited eight um, the Hona Yar stage four Parkinson's patients which is uh, pretty advanced in terms of your stage, I would say moderate to advanced stage, who uh, were recruited, but only five were able to complete the study. Uh, one developed a, a blood clot, another the treatment was not effective, so they dropped out of the study. Another had some issues with delirium. Um, the ECT was, was administered about twice per week for a total of eight sessions. Uh, the number of freezing of gates on uh, during the on state showed some reduction over after the after the treatment but again this is a very small study so I would um, take the results with a grain of salt this is a table showing that um, you know before and after the ECT treatment uh, after the eight sessions uh, twice per week um, their number of freezing episodes during the on state uh, averaged about 1.8 um, over for these patients, and then no. there was about 0 0.4 after the treatment um, in terms of freezing episodes. Their on and off state uh, were about 34.4, uh, 34.3, and then during the on state it was about 19.7. So there is um, some improvement with uh, taking their dopaminergic medication. As far as deep brain stimulation, this is still controversial. Uh, this is also another interest, uh, another research interest of mine is looking at deep brain stimulation to try to, uh, try to improve uh, freezing of gait. So neither the subthalamic nucleus, STN, nor the globus pallidus interna um, has been found to improve freezing of gait so far. There's been a few a small case reports of it helping with freezing, but some other reports saying that it does uh, actually worsen freezing or it can, um, uh, it doesn't impact freezing at all. So uh, DBS is good for certain motor features, the main motor features of Parkinson's disease, for rest tremor, for 
stiffness uh, and for slowness of movements, but it's not good for the axial symptoms, meaning the posture or uh, the um, postural instability, balance issues, and freezing of gait. Those are, will not likely be helped with deep brain stimulation. Um, the, these targets could worsen freezing. Uh, there's another uh, target called the pedu pedunculo ponting nucleus, PPN, which is in the brainstem that's been shown to have inconsistent findings. Um, the low frequency STN simulation using a 60 hertz instead of 130 hertz may show some slight improvement in the freezing that's been uh, studied as well. And how to prevent uh, or how to overcome freezing. There are certain uh, preventative measures that you can think about. Uh, for example, if you have the gait uh, initiation freezing or the start hesitation, you can try to shift your weight from one leg to another uh, before move, moving forward. If you have trouble with the narrow spaces or tight turns, then you can try to take a wider turn, and which, that, which can overcome the freezing. And if, if you have the freezing in the tight quarters, you can try to create wider spaces for yourself in the, in the room or in the house. Uh, this may require a home visit by occupational therapist to assess the home to see if you can make some uh, rearrangements. Um, if it's a time pressure situation, perhaps you can do some behavioral changes, behavioral modification to decrease your anxiety if you're trying to um, go into an elevator or go into the, uh, across the street. Uh, and then crowded situations against anxiety control. And then for dual tasking, you can try to um, not uh, ha have two things going on at once. For example, that someone talking on the cell phone while trying to walk you, can, you should probably uh, do walk or just talk versus trying to do two items at once because the brain is overloaded and they're not, it's not able to handle multiple tasks at one time. So these are just some of the uh, preventative steps that you can take. And that's uh, the end of my talk.